University Video Communications, with the sponsorship of Sun Microsystems, welcomes you to this edition of the Distinguished Lecture Series, Leaders in Computer Science and Electrical Engineering. Today's presentation is NEWS, a networked and extensible window system. NEWS is a system in which client messages containing PostScript programs are passed across a network to be executed by the server. This use of a programming language as a basis of communication protocol provides the extensibility of the windowing system. Our speaker, James Gosling, is a distinguished engineer at Sun Microsystems. James received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University and is the originator of Emacf and Andrew. James Gosling. Hello, I'm James Gosling from Sun Microsystems. I'm going to be talking to you for the next hour about project I've been working on for the last few years. It's called NEWS, the, next wor the Networked Extensible Window System. Uh, there are really three key features of this, of this system that you should understand. Uh, the first is that, it, that it's networked. That is that um, application programs communicate with the window system uh, by passing uh, messages across a network. Uh, this, is, this is in contrast to, to window systems like Microsoft Windows or, or, the, or the Macintosh, uh, where uh, application programs communicate by, um, by making procedure calls. Uh, the, the X11 window system um, is, is, is like news in this way in that, in that everything is done by a, a message passing ac across the network. Uh, the next important thing about news is that it is, it is extensible, namely that the, that the server can have sort of new features added to it on the fly um, by having application programs um, add code to it. Um, you can send procedures across the network um, and these get incorporated into the, into the window system as it's running. And, and, the, and the last point is that it has a very high level imaging model. That is, we uh, try to incorporate very advanced rendering in a device independent way. And the, the, sort of, the sort of applications that we were thinking of when we, when we designed this is you know, people who are doing things like like desktop publishing, things that are um, sort of very much related to paper um, doing sort of 2D graphics. Um, so the, the, the basic structure of the news window system is that it's this, this sort of blob in the middle that um, arbitrates between application programs on the one hand and devices on the other. Um, the applications which you see on the left all communicate with the window system uh, across network connections. These network connections can be um, any, of, any of a variety of types. They can be uh, TCP connections across an Ethernet. They can be DECnet connections. They can be uh, Unix domain uh, sockets on the same machine, or they can even be shared memory. Um, on the other side, um, there, are, there are devices which you know, communicate with the window system in, as, as normal Unix devices. Um, and these are typically things like uh, the display and the keyboard and the mouse, although, th although other devices like, like trackballs um, can, can easily be added. But when you look a little bit closer at the news window system, there's, there's, a, there's a structure um, inside the box in the middle. Um, this, this, this structure contains a, a, a large number of lightweight processes um, which are performing various acts on behalf of the application programs. Um, in many ways, this is, this is like a small operating system where there, there are messages passing from applications to the lightweight processes, between the lightweight processes, and between lightweight processes and devices. So this server really does resemble a, a uh, self-contained operating system. Um, almost all of the issues that you normally see in a normal operating system are, are present in in the news window server, it, it deals with, with, with concurrency, with interprocess communication. Um, it deals with, with the, the normal sort of process control primitives like uh, fork and join and wait. And these, these processes contain code that is dynamically loaded into the window system from the applications or from the file system. Um, these, these little pieces of code are, in general, written in, in the PostScript language. Uh, we chose PostScript uh, primarily because um, we were really interested in people who were doing sort of desktop publishing type graphics, you know, people doing spreadsheets and, and such. And, and PostScript was the this, this standard that was really taking over the whole world of, of 2D imaging. Um, and 
and besides being um, a reasonably complete language, um, it also had a very good um, 2D imaging model built into it. So rather than inventing a new one, we could just sort of, uh, you know, borrow its. Um, so this, this extensibility of, of the news window system is really the central theme of the system. Everything you know, in the system is sort of uh, structured around this concept of, of extensibility, of being able to sort of on the fly alter the beha behavior of the window system by um, changing the code that's executing in, inside the system. So for instance, the, the, the user interface um, components um, are completely lacking. News doesn't have any kind of, of, of user interface when you just look at news, the window system. Uh, rather, what it does is it implements a set of mechanisms for, for doing things like drawing lines, drawing circles, drawing text, um, reading events from the keyboard, um, and all the other things that one, one would normally need in order to build window systems. And then on top of this set of mechanisms, applications and libraries written in, in PostScript code um, through the extension mechanism implement, implement the user interface. Um, they provide these sort of higher level policies about how the, the system behaves uh, by altering the, the basic news window system. Um, so we tried fairly hard to separate policies and mechanisms. Um, and we've, we've been really f fairly uh, religious about that. We don't um, define things about, you know, board, even simple things about, like, like borders around windows. Um, and one of the other things that, y that you can do with, with the extensibility features in the user interface is, is have interactions handled locally, um, avoiding any kind of, of uh, network traffic. Um, so for instance, if, if you're tracking um, a rubber band line, um, rather than having a lot of messages going back and forth across the network, what you can do is send down um, a small piece of PostScript code which sort of sits there in a, in a loop, reading events from the mouse and, and drawing the line as the, as the mouse moves. And then when the, when the user is you know, through dragging the line, um, just finally uh, transmitting the, the, the end coordinates. Um, and, and, in, and in systems where uh, networks are slow or there are a lot of hops between the application and the window system um, or there's the, the network is, ju is just busy. Um, doing this um, short circuiting of, of network traffic um, can make the system a lot smoother and, and make it feel a lot more interactive. So the, the, the messages that, that pass from application programs to the server uh, they contain programs. They're not just sort of directives that say draw a line. Um, you can really, you should really think of the the news window system as being something that is that is executing the the program that is coming across from the client program. So the client program is 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 sitting there, and it isn't really sending messages to the window system. What it is is it's sending program fragments in PostScript across the wire, then it gets to the other side of the wire, and that's this PostScript program is executed in the server. Now a lot of the time these, these PostScript programs will be very simple ones that are just like the typical directives you see in, in a lot of remote procedure call systems. You know, it'll be you know, simple programs that just say draw a line from here to there. Um, but they can also be much more complicated things. They can, they can do things like define procedures which get uh, invoked later, um, or they can um, you know, define loops that, that draw grids, or they can, they can um, create extra processes to go off and do something for you in the background. And then these uh, PostScript co code fragments, if they need to, can send return values back across the network to the, to the application program. So one way to think of this is that you have a, a dynamically changing protocol. Um, you can do um, fairly simple things like, like this, this data compression example where um, what the application wants to do is draw a, a grid of dots. And if you've got a large number of dots to, uh, to draw, um, what you often end up having to do is to send 
just a long list of coordinate pairs um, in, in the sort of draw dot command, um, which um, can involve a lot of traffic across the net. Whereas in news, what you can do is you just write um, sort of two nested loops that, that, that just draw a bunch of dots. Um, so in this example, where it's saying 100, 100, 800, that's the lower bound increment and upper bound of, of one for loop. And then there's another for loop with basically the same bounds. And the inner for loop is just calling the, the, the draw dot command. Um, so you, so the, the number of sort of bytes required to describe sort of an arbitrarily dense grid is pretty much a constant. Um, Whereas um, in, in, in other systems where, 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 where the protocol can't be programmed, um, you often end up having to um, add a lot of extra data. And so you can end up with a lot of coordinate pairs just sort of spewing across the network. I'll cover briefly um, a little bit about the, the, the PostScript language. PostScript is really very, very simple. And, and for us, that was its, its chief attribute. Uh, one way to think of it is that it's uh, the fourth language with types added, uh, which makes it uh, significantly simpler than Lisp. Lisp has uh, a fair amount of structure to it, um, but it does have types. Uh, fourth is very unstructured, uh, but it has no types. Um, like fourth, uh, PostScript is, is, is stack-oriented and uses postfix notation. Uh, most people find this a little, a little hard to understand, um, but, but PostScript was designed as, as a language in which programs wrote programs rather than as a language in which people wrote programs. Although one of the, the interesting things that, that, that has happened with news is that there have been a lot more people writing programs than, than we ever expected. Um, one of the big attractions of PostScript is that it has a, a good integrated graphics model. Uh, when it was developed by the folks at, at Adobe Systems, um, their intention was to use it to drive printers. So the graphics model was the most important thing. And what they were interested in was doing anything that anybody doing any kind of publishing would want to do. And this is you know, exactly the kind of thing that we were interested in, in doing as well. So that there was a fairly uh, good fit between the po both the PostScript graphics model and the PostScript language with what we were trying to do. Uh, one of the other interesting things about PostScript is that um, its execution model is rather, is rather different from any other language in that the, the, the program counter in PostScript is always pointing at a stream in most other languages, there's, there's a concept of some kind of a data structure which is being elaborated. Um, so you've got something like languages like Lisp, where, where the model is that you have this, this sort of hierarchic data structure, and, and there's a program counter sort of scanning through it, or a, a, a normal, um, a, a somewhat more, more normal language like C or Pascal, where the sort of underlying execution model is that, is that, is that there's, this, there's this, this sort of microprocessor or whatever. Um, and, and the program in this microprocessor is, is a series of bytes and there's, a, and there's a program counter that is allowed to sort of hop around in, in the program. Um, and, and because we wanted to use this language for inter, inter process communication, um, sort of hopping around um, wasn't really possible. The, 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 the program sort of comes at the window system as this stream. And the match between PostScript and the, this desire to do this sort of stream across the net was, was, was really very nice. Now, PostScript gets a lot of the, the features of other languages that, that, that one would normally associate with a, a program counter that can uh, jump around by having what amount to data, data structures that can actually contain um, code objects. Um, but these data structures, which are really just arrays that have been marked as executable, um, in some sense are also treated just as streams. So there, there is fundamentally no such thing as a go-to in PostScript. And 
there can be nothing like a go-to in PostScript just because of the way that the execution model works. Um, calling, calling procedures and, and calling loops um, is really, it, it, the model is more like um, switching streams rather than moving a program counter around in one big sort of bag of bytes. Because PostScript is a, is a full-blown uh, programming language, uh, you can also define procedures. So when you define a procedure um, down in the news window system, the, this procedure can be called later on by the application program. So say what you're doing is you're writing uh, some sort of a CAD program, um, and this CAD program is you know, drawing buildings with doors on them. Um, then rather than sending down all the, all, the, all the vectors and polygon fills to draw the doors every time you need to draw a door, you can just send down um, you know, the definition of, a, definition of a procedure which draws the door and then you can just call it every time you want to, want to draw a door. So here's a, here's a really simple uh, piece of PostScript code. Um, the, the body of this, of this function um, starts off by, by pushing two integers on the stack. They're both the, the number 20. Then invoking the move to operator and what move to does is it, is it uh, pops the two numbers off the top of the stack and sort of moves the current pointer to that, that position. Then line to is a similar sort of operator, except that it draws a line from the current position to uh, the position um, indicated by, the, the, by its two arguments. And then we draw another line, and then we close off the path, and then, then finally the function strokes the path where the, the way to think about stroke is that, it, is, is that you've constructed this, this path, which is a, a description of an object, and then you pass a pin along, uh, along that path. Now, this, this body of code that's, that's in between these, these brace brackets is really an executable array. Um, and then up at the top of the screen, you see where, where it says slash triangle. That's the name of the function. Um, and the slash triangle and then the bunch of stuff in brace brackets sticks two things on the stack. And then finally, the, the def operator um, just takes a name and a value and defines that name to have that value. The imaging model in, in news um, comes straight from the stencil paint model in, in PostScript, which came from Cedar Graphics. Uh, Cedar Graphics was a system done at Xerox, Xerox Park. Um, Whose, whose sort of basic operation is this notion of taking some kind of paint, um, some sort of a stencil, and then pressing the paint through the stencil on, on a canvas. Um, and the, the, the stencil is, is composed of um, edges um, constructed by various operators. Um, the, the segments of a stencil can be things like um, straight lines, arcs of circles, um, cubic beziers. Um, and in, in, in news, they can actually also be, be, be quadratic Bezier's. Um, the, the paint can be things like a pure color. Um, it can be things like a, a, a scanned image. Or with the, some, some, of the, some of the new stuff from, from PostScript Level 2, they can be um, procedural um, actions that, that, that are sort of replicated to do interesting, in, interesting tiles across, across the canvas. Um, and the, the other fundamental part of the imaging model is, is, is coordinate transformations. Coordinate transformations are completely ubiquitous. Everything that any application ever does uh, passes through a transformation matrix. So when, when you ask to draw a line from here to there, then the coordinates of here and there are passed through a, a transformation matrix. Um, whenever you try to do something like draw a text, everything having to do with that piece of text passes through the, through the coordinate system. And this, the, this coordinate transform serves to, in many, in many ways, sort of hide a number of the details of the, of the low-level devices. Higher level um, sort of graphics operations are built on top of this. So for instance, line drawing is not really a part of the sort of, ba sort of basic model, rather, um, line drawing is defined in terms of the basic sort of stencil paint model. 
So if you look at this, this diagram on, on, on the left side, you see a path. This, a path is really just sort of an infinitely thin um, sort of line you know, in, in, in 2D space. Um, then there is a procedure, which in PostScript is called stroke path, which takes this line and constructs sort of a set of polygons which, which surround that line. And then this, this, this set of polygons um, is, a, is a stencil, which is then filled. So on, on the right, you see the, the actual line that gets drawn uh, from the initial line that is, that is specified, and then uh, various parameters like the line width and the line join and the end caps for the line are all taken into account when constructing this path that gets, that gets filled. Um, similarly, text is done in the same way. Um, you start out with um, some, some character like, like this uppercase L. Um, it gets looked at as, as a path. Um, and this, this path object gets passed through uh, the transformation matrix and it finally gets filled. Now, in, in both of these cases, this is just the model. This is the way you should think about the way that, that all of these operations happen. Um, and the reason for having this one unifying model is, 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 is just so that it's a lot easier to think about what's going on. You can, you can then sort of generalize from, for instance, um, the definition of the current color and, and know just what the, cur the current color will mean when you draw text. Um, but just because uh, this is the model doesn't necessarily mean that this is actually how it's done. Um, there's an awful lot of sort of trickery done under the, un, under the sheets um, to make sure that when you, when you draw vectors, it actually does draw vectors using all the, 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 the high-speed algorithms that are, that are fairly well known. Similarly, text, um, while it's viewed as being polygon filling on every, on every character, in actual fact, there's, there's all kinds of trickery that goes on with having cached bitmaps and, and, and fonts, um, you know, and pre-computed bitmaps and bitmaps that are constructed on the fly. Um, you know, all the, all, the, all the normal things that, that you would expect a window system to do. But, but all of these, these sort of bit level specifics are all viewed as part of a cache that's, that's completely hidden from the, the real system. Uh, from the real, the real model. This sort of leads us into the, 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 the news notion of, of device independence. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was, was avoid uh, following a, a, a lowest common denominator approach. Um, in a number of the systems that, that, that I had worked with before, uh, people, rather than, than trying to, to look ahead and think about what the devices were going to be like, um, just sort of said, well, what do we have now? So, for instance, Sun's original window system was designed entirely for uh, black and white displays. And then when sort of the world changed and, and color came along, um, it, was, it was handled to a first approximation by emulating black and white in color. Um, and, 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 and also by, by sort of presuming that, that displays didn't have any kinds of, of, of fancy acceleration or um, sort of interesting hardware to do interesting things. Um, so we wanted to, 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 to start by, by trying to, to, to look forward and think about what was going to happen to displays over the next uh, five or ten years. And there were a number of, of, of key things that we thought were going to be important. Uh, one is that we didn't didn't know anything about what kind of resolutions were likely to become common. Um, it also looked as though um, ex hardware to accelerate painting, to accelerate uh, transformations, um, was going to become a lot more common. Um, also, hardware to do anti-aliasing is something that people keep talking about and sort of expecting to happen. Um, also, the, the the sort of clarity of color um, kept. You know, it, was, it was very clear that this was going to get better as the years passed. So there are a number of ways that that, that has, has in fact ha happened. Uh, the, the most common is, is that people are building these uh, frame buffers with, with a lot of bits per pixel. Um, but there are also other frame buffers that do different kinds of encodings. Uh, like people are, 
are accustomed to seeing frame buffers with RGB encodings, but, but in fact there are, there are some fairly interesting reasons to use encodings like, um, like, like YUV or, or CIE, CIE Lab. Um, and we wanted to be able to, to sort of adapt to a number of these things that we could see happening, or at least see being possible in the, in the next few years. Um, so we wanted to sort of stand back from the device. Um, we also wanted to have a model that was, that was, that was so advanced that it would actually make use of some of these features that we could see, that, that we could see coming around. Um, so we tried to build a system um, where, given the devices that we had at the time we were building it, was going to be real hard. Um, and, and, and we tried to sort of emulate um, as much as possible, the kind of things that we would that we would see happening. So, for instance, on on a on a monochrome, you know, black and white screen, you can take a color image, and you know, spray it up on the screen. And 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 rather than having the window system just say no, uh, what it does is it is it is it goes through a fairly complicated uh, uh, transformation from color into black and white. Uh, the particular thing that it that it does is something called Floyd, Floyd Steinberg error diffusion. Um, although the, 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 there there are you know lots of parameters to, to to control what it does, so that you can actually get it to do um, a variety of 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 of, of, of dithering techniques. Um, another one of the important things about the about the imaging model is because it's got the, this, this transformation matrix in between everything and the display, then really it, in a strong sense, doesn't say anything about what a pixel is. Um, it doesn't say anything about um, the pixel boundaries or pixel shapes. Um, also, we didn't want to say about anything about what the pixel contained other than it contains some sort of color, some kind of image. And one of the reasons for not saying anything about the, the size and shapes of pixels is that screen resolutions change. Um, even, even things like the squareness of pixels changes. Um, most of the world's really cheap color monitors are ones um, that are driven by the television industry. And television pixels are not square. Um, so if you have systems like, like the IBM PC where where they do use basically television monitors, and the pixels aren't square. If you use the the sort of typical algorithms you would expect to use for for drawing a circle, um, you draw your circle and you find that it is, it is in fact an ellipse. Um, also, because we didn't want to say anything about sort of what colors were, um, it means that, that that if you do a a a, a YUV encoded frame buffer then applications really don't know anything about it because even though they might specify colors in RGB, um, the fact that this, 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 um, that this transformation occurs is, is completely uh, transparent. Um, so when, when, when applications write something to the frame buffer and then read it back, there's no guarantee that the numbers that they read back will be numerically identical. Um, all they're really guaranteed is if they write something and read it back, and then take that value that they read back and write it again, it'll have the same visual appearance as the original. So the, the focus was on how things looked on the screen rather than the sort of array of bits um, in the frame buffer. Um, another one of the things that, 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 that's good about the model is it has a fairly high level of, of abstraction. It doesn't talk just about things like straight lines. Uh, which was one of the problems with the with the Sunview model. Um, it's got a number of significantly more complicated objects, like uh, like uh, quadratic Bezier's, uh, and and there the, there there are two real reasons for doing this. One is that it makes application programs you know, a lot easier. You know, if your program wants to draw a circle, there's there's actually a command to let you draw a circle. If you want to draw a potato, you can draw a potato. Um, the other reason it has to do with um, the design of hardware, um, namely if, if you've got some clever way of drawing circles in hardware, if your imaging model doesn't have a notion of, of, of what a circle is, 
then all that application programs can do when they want to draw a circle is send out a whole lot of uh, draw straight line requests. And, and so then there's, there's nothing that a hardware designer can do to make circles go faster. Um, so by, by sort of upping the level of abstraction in the model, what you provide is a lot more opportunities for hardware designers to be creative. The device independence model that, that News uses is, is to define a fairly high level model that, that covers as many different hardware characteristics um, as we could think of and try to, to say as little about hardware characteristics as possible so that uh, we could avoid being, being surprised. Um, in general, user programs are completely oblivious to exactly what the hardware looks like. Um, you just, you know, pick colors, draw, pick shapes, draw, um, enter coordinates, and draw. And by and large, you never worry about you know, the exact behavior of the display. Um, now, there are some times when it is important to know, for instance, where the actual boundaries between pixels are, or when it is um, when two colors end up, you know, mapping to the same thing. It's important to know these things sometimes. So, the, so the model in news is that is that is that programs can inquire and adapt to the display, but they don't have to. Okay, and and as much as possible, we've made it so that um, people don't have to notice. Um, this con contrasts fairly strongly with um, device independence in X11, another uh, fairly common Windows system. Um, it's sort of the standard Windows system that, 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 that the world uses. Um, the way that it deals with device independence is that the server defines um, a set of low-level models um, in, 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 the, in the X11R4 spec. It defines six low-level models. Um, and there are the sort of different different models for different kinds of hardware. Um, and this has, has, has a number of advantages. One is it makes the, the, the server a lot simpler. It makes the specification of the system a whole lot simpler. Um, but it has this sort of insidious um, effect on application programs where um, since applications must inquire the, the properties of the device and they must adapt to the device, um, unless the, the, the programmers have been um, particularly careful um, they find that they're, that they're surprised when their program is run on some device that they've never seen before. So the, the PostScript language, as Adobe initially implemented it, was designed for driving printers. Uh, printers are basically fairly simple, simple boxes. I mean, you've got this, this, this drawing surface that's a sheet of paper, um, and all you can do is just sort of take an image and render it on the page and then spit the page out the end. Um, a Windows system has a lot more things to deal with, and we've added a number of extensions to PostScript to deal with these. Um, the first is this notion of something that we call a canvas. Canvases provide multiple drawing surfaces um, on, on the screen. A canvas in, in, in the PostScript world is, is almost like another sheet of paper. Um, so you've got this, this facility to let you um, switch from one sheet of paper to another sheet of paper. Um, these drawing surfaces are, are what are used um, by, by application programs to build sort of higher level uh, images that they, that, that they present on the screen. Things like windows and menus and, and pop-ups are done, are done this way. Um, so a, a, a standard uh, window in the Macintosh world uh, is probably some, some large number of, of PostScript canvases. You know, there's probably one canvas in the middle for the application, and then a, a canvas that forms the border around the application, and then maybe there are some canvases for some decorations around the border. And then within the application's canvas, it might have some more canvases. You know, it might have um, buttons and sliders and, and scroll bars and, and what have you. Um, and these, these canvases can just be um, used to, to put together a user interface. Uh, the next thing that we added to, to PostScript uh, were these things called lightweight processes. Um, a process in news is sort of a separately executing entity with its own sort of program counter. Um, but these processes are lightweight compared to Unix processes in that they're fairly cheap to create and they all share the same address space. 
So one process can, can send something to another process effectively by just, just sort of passing a pointer to it. I mean, it's, uh, everything exists in one big happy address space and communication, communication amongst them is, is really very easy. Um, now, in, in, a, in a, lot of, a lot of systems, um, this would be a very dangerous thing to do. Um, if you tried to do a lightweight process system based on the C language, for instance, because of the, the sort of standard failure modes that you see in C, this would be a very dangerous thing to do. Um, in C, because you've got uh, pointers and you can do pointer arithmetic, one of the most common ways for programs to fail is for them to, to scribble data sort of indiscriminately all over the place. Um, and, and that not only damages themselves, but it damages other processes. Um, so to make lightweight processes work uh, properly, you really need a safe language. Uh, one, of the, one of the first systems that, that, that really did this was the, the, the Cedar Mesa system from, from Xerox PARC. Um, where the, where the MESA language is, is very, very um, safe and protected. It's, it's, it's very difficult for a program to, f for a process to fail in a way that damages other processes. Um, similarly, uh, PostScript, uh, this, the typical failure modes that one sees in, in, in programs that have bugs don't affect any other processes. Um, it's, 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 pretty difficult to just sort of randomly scribble over some other process's um, address space. Um, you know, on average, when a process fails, it just destroys itself. This isn't always the case. Um, it is certainly possible for a process to go and, and tiptoe through, through somebody else's um, data structures. But it's actually hard to do, and typically you have to try to tiptoe through and, and make a mess. Um, Similarly, with the, with the input system, the, the general way that, 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 that these processes fail is that things just stop happening for that process. Um, there are all kinds of flags and things that you can set that, that wedge the whole system, but typically that doesn't happen. Another thing that we added to, to PostScript was we added uh, garbage collection. Um, one of the typical ways that, 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 that programs fail is, is that they um, don't deal with storage reclamation correctly. Either they uh, free something when it isn't really free, and then people start accessing things that, 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 that have been passed on to somebody else, or they don't free something and space just sort of accumulates. And adding garbage collection um, both avoids all of those kinds of failures, um, and it makes it possible for applications to share objects amongst, amongst each other without having to get into all kinds of complicated bookkeeping about of who owns what and who has responsibility for releasing its store. Um, the last major thing that we added to the PostScript language uh, was this notion of, of, of input events. An input event is really just an interprocess message. Uh, these are things that go from one process to another, um, you know, and they communicate all kinds of things. They can be um, selections, they can be keystrokes, they can be uh, mouse motions. So events are these these sort of buckets that contain a location, um, an xy coordinate, um, a, a name, an action, and a timestamp. Uh, the name is usually the name of the thing that happened. So if it was something like the left mouse button, the name would be left mouse button. Um, the action is what happened to the thing that was named. So it can be like up transition or down transition. And the timestamp is an indication of when it happened. Um, so the, these events are all, are all time stamped. Uh, both so you you can you can main, maintain the the correct temporal order of them as they as they pass through various queues, but you can also tell sort of how far apart in time various events happen. So you can um, handle things like double clicking and um, key repeats, um, and and base all your time measurements on the original time at which the the events happened. Um, input events are also used as 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 templates. Um, when, when a process wants to receive input, what it does is it constructs an event, fills in some fields that are sort of like the kind of events that it wants to receive, and then expresses interest in that. And then when events happen, um, there's this, there's, there's this um, sort of pattern matching process that happens that, 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 that determines sort of who should get it. 
And all the fields have what amount to wildcard values where, where you can say, um, I want to get events that happen on, on, on this canvas and with that name, and I don't care what happened to that name. So you can get everything that happens to the left mouse button, you know, whether it went up or down, you don't care. Um, these, these events are also used as, as just sort of general messages um, between processes. And so they, they can be generated by processes, and they can also be generated by external devices and then, and then delivered to, to processes. So in some sense, you can almost think of the keyboard and the mouse as, as these sort of mystic processes that exist off on the other side of some, some you know, misty mountain range that are generating um, events. So when, 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 when an event comes into the system, like, like um, some kind of a mouse action, um, there's, there, there's a collection of, of events that uh, various processes have expressed interest in, and the event is, is matched against um, each of these, and the one that you have a successful match with causes the event to actually be delivered to the, the, the process um, that's associated with that event. Now, one of the other interesting things in, in news that's, that's sort of an extension to PostScript, although in a sense we don't think of it as an extension to PostScript because you can define it sort of within PostScript using the existing mechanisms. That is that we added um, Smalltalk style object-oriented programming. Um, it isn't, it, it, in many ways, it's, it's actually a superset of Smalltalk object-oriented programming because sort of classes are first-class objects and you can perform, you can drive new classes sort of dynamically on the fly um, and, it's, and it's got a really flexible sort of form of multiple inheritance. Um, so classes provide a, a very easy way to define and manipulate objects uh, in PostScript. These objects typically represent things like buttons and sliders and menus and windows. Um, they're defined by the class begin, class end primitives. So you say class begin then you, you define the components of that class, and you say class end, and that takes all those components, bundles them up together, um, takes any classes that are supposed to be sort of mixed into that class, and creates a new class object. Um, and then you can use uh, the new method, uh, which you apply to a, a class as though it was an object, and that creates a new instance for you. Um, you can also you can also apply methods to to objects. Um, well, you typically apply methods to objects using the send primitive, um, and that just take, takes arguments, figures out which which definition of the method for that object is the one that, that should apply, and and does the appropriate thing. Um, one of the one of the tools that's a part of, of of news is this thing called CPS. CPS is the C to PostScript interface generator. Uh, CPS takes as input a specification file, um, which you see on the, on the upper left here, this thing called header.cps. Uh, these specification files have the, the definition of a function where the function header is defined using C syntax, um, but the function body is actually defined as a piece of PostScript code. So here where it says cdef circle cxcyr, that's defining a C function called circle with the parameters C, X, C, Y, and R. And then the function body um, is just one that, 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 that draws a circle at coordinate C, X, C, Y with radius R. Um, and you take this, this, this specification file, compile it with CPS, and it generates um, a number of, 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 of files. That, that, that are really the, the compiled forms of, of, of these specifications. And then when you, then you take these compiled forms in your C program and feed them together through the C compiler, and you get your executable program. So in your program where you um, call the C function circle, um, what, it, what it looks like to you is you're calling the C function and, and giving it you know, the arguments 100, 150 in this example. But what actually happens is that the, the arguments you, you pass in get um, bundled into the, the stream of, of PostScript code, and that gets sent off to the server. Now, one of the things that CPS will have done for you beforehand is that we'll, it will have um, effectively pre-compiled the, the, the PostScript fragment 
and turned it into a fairly tight binary encoding that is that is both very com compact to ship, um, but is but it's also very efficient to execute on the other end. So the News X merge or the X News merge is is a product that that that, that Sun has been um, shipping for a while. Um, it's really the the, the sort of real-world product where, where you can actually see the, the news window system. And what it is really is, is it's sort of two window systems put together. Um, X11 is, a, is a, the standard window system that a lot of, of, of people are using, and it's really a pretty, pretty common one out there that we felt we, need, we needed to support. Uh, one way to think of X11 is that it's, it's really an interpreter for a very simple language. Um, this simple, this, 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 the simple language is just procedure calls with constant arguments. Um, so if you look at the, the standard architecture drawing for, for XNews, um, the XNews server is this sort of big blob, and then inside it there's a set of libraries which deal with um, events and graphics and the canvas hierarchy and such. And then on top of that, there are these two interpreters. Uh, one is the X11 interpreter, the other is the PostScript interpreter. And because they, they, they both share um, the same libraries below the same uh, data structures, um, they interact fairly smoothly in, in terms of things like, like the Canvas hierarchy. Now, one of the um, rather uh, sort of ugly aspects of this is that, is that, is that X11 and, and PostScript have very different ways of thinking about input. Um, and, in, and in particular, they have fairly different ways of thinking about synchronization of input. Uh, because X11 doesn't have um, the ability to, to, to have code in the server, um, synchronization and synchronization locks have to span network transition transactions. Whereas in PostScript, all the synchronization guarantees are within the sort of PostScript language environment, and they never have to span uh, so, so a network hop, which makes um, synchronization a lot simpler in the PostScript world. Um, but because there are the, these, the, these two different world models, um, life gets a little messy. Uh, but outside of that, you know, the, the two of them uh, fit together remarkably well. Thank you very much for your attention.